I want you this morning to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. As we turn again to the scriptures, I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. I love preaching the Word of God. No one has to beg me. I never run dry. I don't run out of sermons, I want to tell you. I don't understand preachers who don't preach the Word of God. It's commanded. It's not sane to preach outside the Bible. And you know what? If only a preacher would stay with the Word of God, the reservoir would continually be flowing. And I I understand what the battles are with preaching. I have those same battles to have liberty, to have freedom, at times through tiredness. But I tell you, this book is open with a fullness of truth. I'm afraid I've ran out of time. I'm not going to get to the end of my days and have preached all that I want to preach. And there's an intensity of, uh, of... of being aware of that. I I actually told this church some years ago, I said, I want to preach on the entire book of Isaiah. It thrills me. For 30 years, I've been in awe of the book of Isaiah. Now, I'm just warning you, there's 66 chapters. It is the longest book in the Bible. And if I ever get onto that, we're going to be here until Jesus Christ comes again. So when I start on that series, just, just you be ready, unless the Lord really helps me in a tremendous way. But we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 2. And we're on this series concerning foundations and of Christ being the only foundation. But this message this morning, part 15, I've called apostolic foundations. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past... Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and come and preach peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And I want you to note this. This is our verse this morning. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's pray together and ask for God's blessing on your life upon our whole gathering. Father, we love you. We bless you, O God. Thank you that we are once strangers. We are once foreigners. We are once outside of all the wonderful covenants that we read of in this Bible. But Lord God, it was the blood that made us nigh. It was the blood that brought us into the Abrahamic covenant, into Noah's covenant, nor God into this covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we praise you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, O God, that you made one body out of two, that you have reconciled Jesus and Gentile, nor God, that you're building together a body that's going to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you for this apostolic foundation, this foundation of the apostles, nor God, and the prophets that we are built on. Lord God, that we are being built on a very solid 
doctrinal, Christ-centered, ancient foundation that's weathered the storms of persecution, of heresy, of apostasy, of the cold night and darkness, nor God that's engulfed our world so often, nor God you have preserved your church from generation unto generation and still she marches on in this last generation. She is assailed by, by science so-called. She is attacked on the left and the right by immorality, O oh God, and by everything that we see around us, yet we still see a pure and holy and righteous church moving forward, evangelizing, rejoicing in our King, Lord God, and preaching the Word of God. Father, we pray that you bless us today, that this may be a church <clears throat> that is built upon a solid apostolic foundation in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Last time we dealt in part 14 concerning restoring the ancient foundations. That was a vital message because it's a prophecy for this church right here, right now. That previous message, it was more than a teaching. It was a word to reveal to you why we're here, very specifically as a church, and what I believe God's plan and purpose is. But I want to move on here in this message this morning. And I've called this apostolic foundations. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean by apostolic foundations. So don't assume you know what I mean by that, because you may not do. I'm going to explain it very, very clearly. But listen again to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2.20. And are built, speaking about those that through the blood have been made citizens in the house of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And so the Bible says, we are built upon the foundation of apostles and of prophets. My message, apostolic foundations. Not every church in this hour is built on an apostolic foundation. I'm not talking about you individually. I'm talking about us as a church, this church here. I believe we are built on an apostolic foundation, and I'll show you what it means. But I assure you, church after church that I have seen does not have an apostolic foundation. Quite the opposite. They have the exact opposite, something opposed to an apostolic foundation. But unless I explain what that means, you won't even think about it. You know why? Foundations are hitting. Foundations are below the ground. Foundations are out of sight. All you see is the building. So you look at the building and you may not stop to consider what is the actual foundation upon which this church is being built. And you know what? If you get the foundation wrong, everything is wrong. And even if it was right and looked right and people thought it was right, it would only be for a short time. Because when the storm comes, it gets tested. When the trials, when the troubles, when death comes, then we're going to find out what the foundation actually looks like. But I believe we, the real church, the real body of Christ, the real individual local churches must have an apostolic foundation. And you know what? We test churches by their foundation, not just by their individual members. I want to know what a foundation is built, what, a, what foundation a church is built on, or what the preacher is promoting. I want to know what is the source what is the thing that you build on, that you build everything on, that was most important in this church? I want to know what it was. I want to know what the first thing in that preacher's mind is its size. One preacher went public in this city, and he said, this is the vision for our church. We want the biggest church in Limerick. He never mentioned the name of Christ. I want to tell you, that is a faulty foundation. 
You, you cannot have such a vision for your church impart it to the people and tell the community our vision is to be the biggest church without causing great harm to the work of God. That is not the vision of this church, I want to tell you. Our vision is that Christ might be glorified and much, much more that all of that involves. But I've got four points for you here from these verses in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 20 to 22, I've got four very important points I want to make concerning having an apostolic foundation. Number one, ancient foundations. To have an apostolic foundation, what do I mean? How do you know you've got an apostolic foundation? Well, this is the first mark. It is ancient. Apostolic foundations are not new. That might seem like simple and obvious, but it's not to the church world. It's not to the mega preachers. It's not to the vast majority of so-called Christians. If you want a real apostolic foundation for your church, the first thing is it's an ancient foundation. It cannot be new. It cannot com be contemporary. It cannot be something that we have never seen before, or else it's not an ap apostolic foundation. It says here in verse 20, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. I want you to see carefully. It is not talking about modern apostles and prophets. It's talking about ancient apostles and prophets that were alive 2,000 years ago. You see, the real foundation it's speaking about here in verse 20, <clears throat> the foundation of the apostles and prophets it is actually talking, it is not actually talking that the apostles and the prophets were the foundation. Listen to what it says. It says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It doesn't mean that the church, the Ephesian church, was built upon the apostles and the prophets. It doesn't mean that. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? It means we are built on the foundation that they laid. The foundation of the apostles and prophets is the foundation they laid down, that they preached, that they taught, that they occupied themselves with this labor. Do you remember what we already dealt with in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 10? Talking about Paul being the wise master builder. And the, the term master builder, remember that first sermon? I said, it's someone who's been handed a plan. He, he's not the architect in that sense of designing it. He gets handed a plan and he starts the whole building project. That's what a, a master builder is. Now listen to what Paul says. He says, I am a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. Then he says in chapter 3, 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here's Paul saying, I'm laying down a foundation. I am actually putting in place and no other foundation can be laid than Jesus Christ. So when we read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, it's speaking about specific men, not just the ministry. He is speaking about certain men in that first century called apostles and prophets. They laid the foundation. They taught the scriptures, not just the apostles, but the prophets as well. And notice it's not talking about Old Testament prophets. I can prove this easily from other verses in Ephesians. It's the apostles and prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church, given unto the church with a doctrine for the church. So true apostolic foundations are actually teaching the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. A true apostle lays down an ancient foundation. It's not new, it's not contemporary. Again, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, it says this, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Talking about the Old Testament, and there was lots of prophets then, but he's not talking about that. In other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, 
So look, he's talking about it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It is now revealed in the New Testament through apostles, through prophets. And then he's going to tell you what was revealed. What's he talking about? What was revealed to the early church, the foundation that wasn't in the Old Testament? Well, he goes on. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And again, you get this in Ephesians 2. What is he dealing with? This reconciliation between Jew and Gentile becoming one uh, people, one body, one church with one foundation. And that foundation was laid by the apostles and prophets. So you begin to see that there's a very ancient foundation. An apostolic foundation is a very ancient foundation. The foundation isn't being restructured every single generation. That is very dangerous for the church. Listen again in chapter 4 of Ephesians verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Christ gave them into the church their ministries. And never confuse an apostle with a prophet. They're not the same. Some modern writers, they've tried to merge it and said, it's apostles and prophets are one office. No, it is not. All these terms are distinct. They're never mingled. They're a different ministry, a different calling, a, a, a different way of operating. Do not confuse them. So look at this ancient foundation, this, sorry, this apostolic foundation. The first mark is it's an ancient foundation laid down by certain apostles and certain uh, prophets in the first century. They ministered the revelation of God. They could see this revelation. The Jew was going to be reconciled with Gentile, that the Gentile nations in their entirety were going to be brought in on this, that this was a worldwide gospel, that we are to evangelize all nations, that this was going to reach the ends of the earth. You see, there was a new revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they began to bring this forth, it is what they preached in the, in the epistles and the letters and the gospels of our New Testament. What was Paul doing? He was laying down a foundation. What is the foundation? It's Jesus Christ. What, what was Luke doing? He was doing the same. What did John do? What did Peter do? You see, this is the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's not that we build the church on Peter. And you know that already. We dealt with that. You know the Catholic Church to say, Peter is our foundation. A man, a man who Jesus had a rebuke and say, get thee behind me, Satan. They said, Peter's the foundation. Peter's a very poor foundation. He was a great preacher. He was a great man. He had a great anointing. He had a great apostolic calling. But I wouldn't build my life, my eternity, or this church upon Peter. No way, Jose. Not a chance in a million. I need something more solid than Peter or John or Paul. They themselves are not the foundation. But when it says we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, what was their foundation? It was Christ, only Christ. That's what they preach. Paul himself says there is no other foundation than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you why this is so important. And I'm giving you some very important things here. That if you understand this message, you'll understand the church worldwide. You'll understand contemporary Christianity. In this point, as we say, this apostolic foundation is ancient. It's not new. Do you know what I'm saying? The contemporary church has got it wrong. Much that comes in that is new. They copy the world. They copy the world's music. Where did contemporary Christian music come from? The sound, the look of it, the style, the dance, the movements. It's an absolute mimic of the world. And I tell you, not going back to my childhood, but somewhere in between. The church is about 10 years behind the world. We'll copy the world. You know, we are, we are just in Germany. You, you've got the biggest Pentecostal charismatic churches, smoke machines, dark lights. You can't even make out the words they sing in their worship. Don't tell me that comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't. You know what? That is new. That is trendy. That has come from the world. 
But you know what? The real church builds on an ancient foundation. It goes right back to the New Testament, right back to the apostles. I want to see what foundation Peter laid. I want to see the foundation Paul laid and John and Jude and Luke and Matthew and the rest of them. I, I want to begin to see and understand what sort of foundation do they build? You know why? Because when you get the foundation right, you get the church right, and you get the ministry right, and you get the children right, and you'll get your families right. But we need that solid foundation. You see, I believe the contemporary church, they actually turn their back on what is ancient. They said, you need to move with the 21st century. You need to look a certain way, speak a certain way. We, we redefine the church. We reinvent the church. I hear it all the time. You know, you know, I'm very interested in church structure, what the church looks like, church government. I studied it for 40 years. Even as a kid, I was fascinated by church government, how, how elders and the gifted ministries operate together. That's not normal things. No kid sits down and says, I want to comprehend the five ministries, how they function in the body. That is not normal. That, that means the Spirit of God is stirring something. But you know what? Today's modern church, they, change, they don't talk about eldership anymore. It's ministry teams. Now, why have you changed that? Why do you change all the terminology? Why are you trying to change something that was taught by the apostles and the prophets in the first century? Why is it there's a minimizing of the person of Christ who is the only foundation? You see, we've gone through 20 years, two decades Ha, uh, uh, maybe a third or half of my life, where I've heard this trend sweep the church. We want to go back to the ancient church. We want to rediscover what the church fathers believed. We want to go back to the earliest writings of the church and, and make that our authority. Do you know why that's happened? Because the contemporary church has gone so crazy, so, so crazy in its doctrines, its styles of worship, it has so changed everything, being led by the whims of men who said, I've had a dream, I've had a vision, I've had a prophecy. I think we should do this. Men who said there's nine people in the Trinity, utterly impossible. You can't get nine people in three persons. It doesn't work. But we have had year after year of heresy, confusion, big movements, things sweeping the church. That's contemporary Christianity, the prosperity gospel, the worldly gospel, the self-esteem gospel, the social gospel. All of these things have destroyed the church. Do you know what the reaction is? People are left barren, empty, no doctrine, no reality, no Christ, no consistency. Every single year the church gets revamped. A new famous preacher, a new book, a new theme, a new revelation of blood moons or whatever it is. It's always something new. So every year you've got to keep up with this. It's like the latest style, the latest music, the latest whatever. And you know what? You've got no foundation anymore. You don't realize you are moving away from something solid. And I want to tell you, what is real is ancient. It's unchanging. It is eternal. It came out of eternity. And so this foundation is ancient. But the reaction to contemporary Christianity is this search for the ancient church. And you know what they mostly do? Now, I've got no problem reading the church fathers. I've got no problem you being interested in history. There's no problem in that. I am. I've got books on my shelf. So I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this insatiable search across today's church to go back to the second century and the third century and say, we want to see what they say, then it carries weight because they're closest to the apostles. And if they're the generation that got saved through the apostles and lived and heard the apostles and then uh, preached the generation after the apostles, they must carry weight and authority. They saw John before he died. So their letters must be very pure. What a load of rubbish. I'm hearing this all across the internet, all across mega ministries. It's becoming popular and it's affecting the church. I want to tell you that Jude at the end of the first century warned of apostasy and men coming into your midst and men that are sitting in your churches. You know what Peter done in his two letters? He warned them. There's people sitting in your agape, uh, agape meals in the church, and he warned you about them. John, John done it. Peter done it. Jude done it. 
warning. Don't tell me those that sat under the apostles were pure. They are not our example. It is apostolic doctrine. Do you hear me this morning? I'm giving you a very weighty warning. We don't go back to church councils. Nicaea and 325. We don't go back to the ancient church creeds and that becomes our authority. Most of them were Catholic anyway. You know, a lot of those creeds I'd agree with almost completely, but they're not my authority. I do not hold to the creeds of Christianity as if they carry weight and authority. No, they do not. And this is where the reformed churches have gone wrong and the charismatic churches and the contemporary church. Do you know what? Our foundation is very, very ancient. It goes right back, not to the second century, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, or even the 15th, 16th, 17th. You know where our foundation goes back to? Right back to the days of the apostles. That's where we need to go back. You see, there's many in this hour, they become disillusioned by this lack of foundation. Lack of consistency. They're moving, constantly changing their doctrines, looking for strategies, changing the style of the church. You know, if every week I seen you, here you come, uh, Brother Elvis, he's got purple hair this week, maybe red hair next week, the week after that, and he doesn't, thank God. And the week after that, he's got blonde hair. He, he comes in with styles. Everything's tight this week and next week. It, it's all big flares. Some of you young ones, you don't even know what flares are. They'll come back in. They're coming after you, I want to assure you. Now, when you see someone coming, do you know what I'm going to say? That person doesn't know who they are. They've got no identity, no consistency. They're really confused. And you know, they're going to be happy. We see it on our streets, but it's invaded the church. Oh, this week, we've redefined the church. We've redefined worship. We're changing the whole style. Now we're going to dance differently than we were dancing last year. We, we, we're, we're going to train you how to do this. We'll send you to hill songs or we'll send you to some other place. And this is how you're going to do it. Do you know what? The whole generation is sick to death. They're finding now they don't have any foundation. They don't know what they believe. They don't know where they're going. They don't even know what the church is, is anymore. And this is widespread across the church. And so there's many who are seeking for foundations. They're seeking for their roots. They're seeking it in church history or in looking for something old or archaic structure or antiquity or some outward form of ritual. And so they even go back to the Lord's table and say, no, it, it, it's the, what is it the Catholics call the? The Eucharist, that's the word I'm looking for. So they say, this is the Eucharist. No, it's not. This is not the Eucharist. There's communion. There's the Lord's table. Eucharist as a word is a Catholic word. It's not a born again word. Show me it in the Bible. In the Bible, it's breaking a bread. In the Bible, it's communion. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a remembrance table. That's what the Bible teaches. But you've got all these big preachers now, and they're saying, We're going back to the ancient church. We're finding there's truth amongst the Catholics. We're finding we've rediscovered the Eucharist. And so we're saying there's more to the Eucharist. Do you know what? They have lost their groundings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's those, there's new charismatic ministry sweeping the church. They say, oh, water baptism. You stay in the water. You get washed from your sin while you stand in the water. That is heresy. That is actual dangerous heresy. And I'm sad to say it, a man like David Pawson actually taught that, that you get cleansed from your sin in the water. That is dangerous doctrine. Now it's in a movement, charismatic a widespread movement, and this is what they're promoting. Can I make a plea here this morning? Let's go back to apostolic foundations once again. Do you want tradition? Do you want history? Do you want what is old? Do you want what is solid? Then go back to this foundation. It is the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It is them. It is their message. It is the doctrine. It is inspired scripture. This brings me to the second one. My second point here with these verses, it's not only an ancient foundation, it's a biblical foundation. So our foundation is very old, it's not new. I am not trying to come into the 21st century, Brother Keith, come into the 21st century. Not a chance in a million. 
I'm going to go right back and revisit the upper room. I'm going to revisit Calvary. I'm going to stand where those apostles stand. I'm going to discover the gospel that they had. But this second one, biblical foundations. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they, that is the early church, continued steadfastly in four things. He mentions four things. Steadfastly, continued steadfastly. That means there's a lot of opposition to move you. To continue steadfastly is you dig your heels in. You stand on the spot. You say, I'm not for changing. I'm not moving from these four things. What does he mention? Apostles' doctrine or teaching. What the apostles taught themselves. Second of all, fellowship. How you fellowship and commune together. Pray for one another. Exhort one another. Encourage each other. That, that is fellowship, saints, and, and we make a big deal of fellowship. You know, you can't have fellowship by yourself. And it says continue steadfastly in fellowship. Be very careful of the devil separating you out as an individual. You cannot get fellowship by yourself. That is a body thing. So apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread. See, this Lord's table is not ritual. The early church said, we continue steadfastly. Listen to Brother Soap uh, around this table this morning, reminding us, didn't you rejoice this morning? W weren't you glad this morning to break bread here together, to, to hear that you're justified, you're sanctified, that you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus? Isn't it a glad time to remember the death? You know what the, our Bible say? Continue steadfastly in breaking of bread and in prayers. Do not neglect prayers. If prayer decreases in this house, I want to warn you, if you let prayer go in your individual life, this church loses prayer. If you treat the prayer meeting lightly, we have lost prayer in this church. That is a dangerous place to be. The devil will attack the prayer meeting and your prayer life and your crown out to God. But I want you to notice in this second point, our foundation is a biblical foundation. When we say about going back to ancient foundations, the one laid by the apostles and prophets, it's the apostles' doctrine. I want to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That doesn't mean every new group of apostles, and here, I believe in apostles for today. I believe in prophets today in the church. They were never removed from the church. They have consistently come and been given to the body. But I do not believe that all these men calling themselves apostles today are apostles. They're not. They're mostly heretics. They're false teachers. They're deceivers. They're liars. They don't match up to scripture. But listen to me. I don't keep lining up with a new generation of teachings by new apostles. Oh no. What the Bible says is continue steadfastly in the doctrine of the apostles. The first apostles. So we see that scripture that was given by the Holy Spirit. Why would the Holy Spirit speak to you and give you a dream? And I believe in dreams, and I believe in visions, and I believe in prophecies, but why would he give you that if you neglect this book? See, if you're not reading this book, if you're not in this book, if you're not studying this book, don't come to me and tell me that God's given you a prophecy for me, or a word, or you think, or you've got an impression. Why would the Holy Spirit speak to you? Whenever the Holy Spirit's given us an entire book, an entire New Testament, with sound, deep, consistent teaching. One chapter in this book is worth more than any man's ministry, I want to tell you. This is filled with sound, sound doctrine. You see, if we are going to have an apostolic foundation, we need to go right back to an ancient foundation. We need to go back to the first century. We need to be sure that's our foundation, what they ministered. But it's gotta be a biblical foundation. The doctrine of the apostles as they taught it from Christ at the beginning. What did they teach? Without studying it, you don't even know. And you know what they taught on marriage? They taught on fellowship in the church. They taught on prayer. They taught on evangelism by example and by solid teaching. They told you how to resolve issues in your own life or attitudes between one another. They t tell you how to reconcile, how to forgive each other. All of this fills scripture. It is apostolic doctrine. 
So if we're going to have an apostolic foundation, we need apostolic doctrine. We need it to permeate our thinking, our preaching, our fellowship, our, our, our conversations together. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Turn to the whole church. Let us walk by the same rule. See the word rule there is the Greek word canon. Have you ever heard of the canon of scripture? Lots of people talk about the canon of scripture. The canon of scripture is when they finally decided in the fourth century what books went in the Bible. What a load of rubbish. You need to listen to some messages we preach in this church in your Bible. That isn't correct. They had the full canon by the end of the first century. No man decided that at Nicaea. That was given by the apostles. They gave the books of the Bible. Be very careful what you hear on YouTube or, or, or from your friend or from some sermon of an intellectual person. I can prove it with my Bible. Those statements are not correct. But listen to what Paul says. Let us walk by the same rule. What does the word rule mean then? If they're wrong and saying, oh, the canon of scripture means they decided. No, no, no. This is the rule. Okay, they're right on that point. The Bible is the rule. But listen to what the word rule means. The word canon, rule. Do you know what the Greek word means? It means a rod. It was a measuring rod used in those ancient days. It's used five times in our New Testament. It means an instrument that can draw a straight, clear, definitive line. It means the standard that this canon is the standard, the only standard. There is no other standard. This is the standard by which you measure everything. Can you imagine if we all defined what a foot was by going by our own feet or by the length from the hand to our elbow? It would all vary in here. Well, my foot is the measurement foot. No, it isn't. You have a foot, but you don't have the accurate measurement. We'd be all over the place by saying, my foot is the official international foot. Well, maybe it is. We can test it. We'll try that later. Like Cinderella with her slipper. We'll find out if your foot, if your cannon is actually the same as the international authoritative one. It can be tested. You know why? Because a foot is a foot is a foot, but not your foot. All of you have different feet. Now, there's the problem in the church. Everyone says, I've got a way to judge. I've got a standard. I've got an opinion. Yeah, but it all varies. There's only one canon that never changes, and that's the canon of Scripture. You may say you've got a canon. I've got a standard. I've got a rule I live by. I've got a straight line I walk by. But is it the rule? Is it this canon of Scripture? So listen again what Paul says. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be, fo be followers together of me and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. So Paul is saying, I'm walking according to the rule, the canon of scripture. There has to be a straight line, a standard. There has to be an authoritative way to test all things, every opinion in this church, every thought, every teaching, every style, every action. There's got to be a way that we can test things. Well, we have it in the scripture. That's why I'm saying this foundation, this apostolic foundation is a biblical foundation. It has the authority of God's word. Listen again how this word is used in Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. And as many as walk According to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So we see that the early church had a biblical foundation. The apostles, Paul wasn't the authority, neither was Peter the authority. But they all said, we walk according to a set rule, a straight line, a definitive authority. You are not the authority. This church is not the authority. Our opinions are not the authority. You cannot change the Bible. You know, every time you have a conversation with me, 
my entire conversation is thinking scripture and not one scripture taken out of scripture. The scripture held in balance with 10 other scriptures. You know how I used to preach? I, I, I sort of had to calm down on this with age. But when I used to preach in my 20s, for every scripture I used in a message, I would say I'd studied or I'd referenced 10, maybe 20 other scripture for every single scripture I would ever use or ever mention in a message. So I didn't even do one message without looking at a broad perspective of scripture. You can't make your stand or die on your hill on one scripture. You can't do that. That's where heresy comes from. That's where extremism comes from. We've got it all across the church. Someone pulls out a scripture, builds on it, and said, this is my protection. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, but you're breaking 10 other verses. You've got to have a biblical foundation. You've got to read the Word of God. You've got to understand the Word of God. You've got to listen to the Word of God. We've had some of those smart Alex in this city. Uh, there's been hundreds of them, to be quite honest. We've only met hundreds, but there's probably thousands. And, and they say, oh, but the Spirit taught me. I don't need a teacher. The Spirit leads me. Well, God should have changed the order of his church and not put teachers in the church. He should have just said, well, you should all know this. You, you don't even know the names of the apostles, do you? But, but yet you know so much. You think you know so much that you don't listen to anyone else. No one can correct you. No one can bring you to Scripture. Your foundation is not biblical. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and 2. Fulfill ye my joy. Would you do the same for me, please? Fulfill ye my joy. What would make an apostle happy? What would make Keith Malcolmson happy? That ye be like minded. Do you know to be like minded? It means to exercise your mind, to use it, to operate in it, and having a oneness of mind. You've got to use your intellect. You've got to engage your brain. We've got to come to a similarity. Now, as I said before, I believe in unity. I believe in like-mindedness. I believe in speaking the same thing, because the Bible says that, and thinking the same thing, and acting according to the same rule. I believe that, but we're not all there. We're growing. It's a lifetime process of sanctification, of learning, of making mistakes, going wrong, down wrong avenues and go, why didn't I listen to the word of God? Or why didn't I listen to this person over here? So it's a lifetime process. I've gone down cul-de-sacs. I so burnt myself at times, I never forgot that. I learned from the experienced saints of God. But here he says, be like-minded. What does it mean to be like-minded? Then he explains, having the same love. That's like-mindedness. And you're not the example. Christ is the example. He says, having or being of one accord. That word accord's an instrumental musical term, to be of one accord. You ever heard anyone play an instrument and it wasn't in accord with other instruments? Or someone singing and they're not in accord with everyone else in the room? It's sort of great. I've got a hypersensitivity to these things. It really knocks my whole balance out. I, I, I'm sorry for that. That's my, I, I, I cover it in love, but I can't ignore it. It's just how I operate. So being out of accord, I notice that. One person out of accord here, I notice it. Of one mind. So this like-mindedness, it's this love, this similarity of love. But we're not the focus of that love. We don't decide it. Calvary decided that. Jesus Christ decides that love. It's not that we just blend in and become one in mind. Oh no, it's his mind becoming our mind. How he thinks, how he acts, how he speaks. It says, let nothing be done, we're still in this like-mindedness, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, see how it's all about the mind, lowliness of mind or humility of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. If you don't esteem others better than you, it's a bad reflection on you. You're very proud. You're very arrogant. If you always look down on everyone else, it means you've got no humility if your mind is like that. It says again in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, But if I tarry long, how that thou madest, mayest know how that you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the living, which is the 
Church of the living God. Listen to this. What is the church where we're meant to learn how to live? The pillar and ground of the truth. A pillar, if the church is the pillar of truth, it means it holds up the truth. It does this. It lifts up the truth of God. That's what the real church does. If you're learning to live right in the church, to behave yourself. Paul said, I, I've been kept away from you so you can learn how to live in the church. And you know what? The mark, when you live right in the church, you're lifting up the truth. Don't tell me, I believe in the authority of Scripture. Okay, do you in your personal life? I see all the time people who authoritatively believe this book is authoritative, inspired of God, perfect in every detail. But they don't believe that practically in their life. I, I see it all the time. They, they can't do because they constantly go against it. Or, or they have a form but yet they're not walking in the light of Scripture. So they're not holding up the Scripture. They're not the pillar for the truth because you know what? They've exalted their own intellect, feelings, actions, their own person, so they're not holding it. But we as a church here, we must never do that. Other churches can do it. They, they will have a way of operating and say, we believe in the Bible and chuck it on the floor. I was once in a meeting, the preacher took it, threw it across the floor. I walked out the back door, went and preached on the high street. Never been that town before. Boy, we stirred the sinners that night. The police come to arrest us. But I tell you, I'm not staying in that house. I would rather be arrested on the high street preaching to sinners than in, in what's called the house of God. And they threw this book. You know, if you're ever evangelizing a Muslim, don't you dare put your Bible on the ground. They won't listen to you. All they'll say is that Bible and go, you have an utter disrespect for the word of God. I was in a church once, they got a Muslim lady converted. She'd come to visit, she sat with our pastor and he said the conversation changed. He went and took his Bible, he's speaking to her, preaching to her. He puts the Bible on the floor, the whole atmosphere changed. And she says, pastor, never, ever put God's word on the floor. Because that tells me what you think of it. I'm not saying to worship a book. I'm just telling you. It also says that the church is to be the ground of truth. And in other words, this is where it rests. It rests easily in our midst. Number three, not only an ancient foundation, not only a biblical foundation, but a Christ-centered foundation. I've got so many important things. I'm going to miss up point four. Point four is going to next week. I want you to hear it. Because you know what? I, 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 I am so concerned for the truth of God. I'm so eager for what we become as a church. Apostolic foundations. But this third point, a Christ-centered foundation. Look at verse 20. It says, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So notice this in fullness. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And then this next statement, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We are built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, the one that they laid down, the one that they taught, the one that's ancient, the one that's biblical, the one that they taught and laid down in Jerusalem and in Rome. But this third point, it says that foundation, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And this is my third thing about apostolic foundations. It's a Christ-centered foundation. Not only ancient, not only biblical, it is Christ-centered. When you find a real foundation in a church, it's connected to the centrality of Christ. Christ is everything. Absolutely everything. What's the chief cornerstone in the building? See, we know Christ is the foundation, but a chief cornerstone's different. It's not the same. It's not confused here. The foundation's one thing. The, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, what they lay down. But now they're saying, here's something else, a chief cornerstone in the building. What is the chief cornerstone? It is the most in, indispensable stone in the entire building. It's more than that. It's the primary stone. It's the first stone. 
Have you ever heard or seen this tradition of people gathering to lay the first stone of a building? It's within our culture and they have a celebration in a community. They're going to build a great building. What do they do? The entire community gathers for that first one stone. And it's a tradition now. But see, in ancient days, that first stone was the most preeminent stone. It was the most important, the most vital. In fact, it's going to affect every single other stone in the entire building. It is the first one. And you know what? We gather in culture, we gather to watch it, and we celebrate, and we rejoice. Here is the building. We're thinking about an entire building to serve the community, but that first stone is utterly indispensable. That is, where that stone is put is the most important. It is the most important stone in the building. The first stone, listen, it's visible. The foundation is invisible, but this stone is. It's always, they often write on it. Someone's name gets put on it or some motto gets written on it. But you see this stone here, this actual stone is, in, in, is indispensable. It is visible to the naked eye. You don't see the foundation, but you've got to see this. See, when you come into a church, I'll tell you if that church is Christ-centered, I'm going to see Christ. And you know what? He's the most important stone. He is the first stone. He's a visible stone. But listen, why did they put a chief cornerstone in there? Was it a memorial? Was it merely pictorial? Was it merely symbolic? No. That stone was always the biggest stone of the entire building. You would see it from the outside and on the inside. Listen to what, and I, I looked up some of the facts of these chief cornerstones and in engineering and building in olden days. And this is what I come up with. That chief cornerstone unites the entire building. Every stone comes into unity through that one stone. If they're rightly related to it, then they're right in order with each other. So we see if someone is right with Christ in the church, they will be aligning with every other stone in the building. If you're not right with Christ, you're always going to be a stone that sticks out of the wall, knocks everyone else out of place. But there's something about being aligned rightly with Christ. You fall into rank, you fall into order. And so this cornerstone, this chief cornerstone, joins every part of the building correctly together. In fact, it rests on the foundation and it brings into contact every stone in that building to a right relationship with the foundation. That one stone aligns everything. It brings unity. Do you know what we have in the verses before this? That cornerstone brought two great walls together, two different walls going in two different directions and it unites them in that one cornerstone. See in the verses before where we read, what's Paul saying? that these two great walls was Jew and Gentile reconciled through the blood of Christ. He said, I've made one out of Jew and Gentile. It's not two people now. It's not two different movements. You know what, Jew and Gentile, that's why I would never tolerate a Jewish church. They may be born again, praise God. They may have some insights into Hebrew culture and teaching and words, praise God. But why not join the church of God? It's Jew and Gentile. And you know what, this great cornerstone, it joined those that were most a controversy. I'll tell you what else it joins. It joins people of every ethnic family background, every color, every language, every nation, every nationality. It joins, hey, the worst of it all, the, the most extreme diverse thing of all. It even unites men and women in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, these are the issues of controversy. Nations are being burnt down. Colleges are being destroyed. Our society is being ruined by people who are clashing. You know this cornerstone? You know what it does? When you find a real apostolic foundation, look for the cornerstone. That cornerstone unites the whole building. The most contrary personalities in the church. Do you know who they were in the early church? Do you know which two people in the apostolic band were more at each other's throats than anyone else? Peter and John. Peter and John. Jesus, uh, Peter said to Jesus about John, huh, this is my translation, okay? Don't copy it. Huh, who's he? 
What about him? What's he going to do? My translation again. Jesus said, Peter, never you mind. Let me tell you how you're going to die in a few years. You're going to die as a martyr. And I'm talking about a real conversation in Scripture. Do you, do you see that Christ is there in the center of this? Do you know a little bit later, not long later, a little bit later, what do you see in Acts chapter 4? Who's going up to the prayer meeting at the same hour, hand in hand almost, Peter and John? They're going there at a set time to a, a, a Pentecostal prayer meeting. And on the way, they heal a man who couldn't walk, a lame man who Jesus walked past before. But here they're unified. How did that happen? The chief cornerstone. The building is now being built. It is being raised up. That stone not only unites, it aligns. That stone is set in place. Now every stone has to align with that stone. In other words, there's a standard in the church. Your love isn't what this church is about. I'm sorry to tell you that. Or your ability to judge. You see, in the church of God, everything aligns that stone. What does love look like? Look at Jesus Christ. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He loved his enemies. He washed the feet of someone who's about to betray him, who's stealing money out of the bag. He washes their feet. That is love defined. Look at Calvary. Look at everything. Look at his righteous judgment. Look at how he deals with money tables in the temple. He turns it over. Oh, that can't be love. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He aligns everything in the church. You're not the center of this. You're not the example of this. I'm only an example as an elder, as a preacher, if I fulfill all the qualifications. Follow me. What did Paul say? Oh, we don't follow any man. Have you ever heard that in the church? I have lots of time. We don't follow any man. I follow Jesus. Then you're on biblical. You don't have a biblical foundation. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, follow me to the degree that I'm an example. The Bible says elders are given to be in samples, examples. If you're not, if Brother Soph isn't, we'll throw him out. We'll, we'll cancel his eldership. Do, do you know you're meant to be an example? We only appoint someone when they've worked hard at that, put that into place. I'm qualified by a lifestyle, a way of thinking, a way of preaching. I'm qualified for this. And, and do you know what? We follow exampleship. But do you know what? I'm not the example. I'm only trying to follow him. I'm trying to obey the word of God. I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm imperfect in the final sense. But you know what? Christ, the cornerstone, he aligns everything. You know that cornerstone keeps everything straight. It causes stability. It anchors you to the foundation in a very correct and a right way. When Jesus actually says about this cornerstone himself, in Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke 20, he quotes about the cornerstone. He goes back to Psalm 118, verse 22, where it says this, the stone which the builders refused is become the head of the stone of the corner. Who was he rejected by? The Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priesthood, the high priest, the nation, the temple, the institution. Look at them. They've got their Bible. I know the Bible. We preach it every week on the Lord's Day, on, on, on the Sabbath. Yeah, but you rejected Christ. You've got all that knowledge, but you reject the cornerstone. You think you've got an old foundation or a biblical, but is it Christ-centered? Is Christ the very alignment of your life? Does everything center around Christ? Well, Christ uses this to talk about you, religious establishment, have rejected the stone. But you know what? That stone becomes the most important stone in the building. And I want to tell you, churches all over our world have rejected this cornerstone. They say, we're all about Christ. We believe all these things. We teach all these right things. Where is Christ aligning everything? You're not even in a straight line with him. You're not even lining up your life with him. Your love life and your thinking and your doctrines, why aren't you aligned with him? He's, 
He is the focus of everything in the local church. He is everything, saints of God. I want to plead with you in this church. I want to plead with everyone online. Let's align ourselves to the cornerstone. Christ is not only the foundation, he is the cornerstone. The most important stone in this building is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one more important than him, saints. And we want to align in our conversation, our attitudes, our doctrines, how we live out our life, how we speak to a sinner. We want to do all of this. You don't damn the woman to hell at the well of Samaria. You teach her to worship. She already knows she's a sinner. She, she needs to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, go, go tell Herod, you fox. Go tell the Pharisees they're proud and arrogant and religious. Yeah, call them a brood of vipers. But that poor woman at that well, don't, don't you mess with her. Jesus never. Do you notice the way how it always says that he, he's there? It was an accusation against him. He's sitting drinking with alcoholics and harlots. You know, people for years have used that and said, see, Jesus went into the pub. He went and sat down. No, he didn't. It doesn't say that. They all came and sat with him. They weren't scared away. The worst of people in those communities, the prostitutes come and sat with them and listened, open-eyed, utterly in awe at these teachings. We never heard anything like this. We, we, we just don't understand. We can't know how. How could you ever love us and heal our sick bodies? See, this is the real Christ. Let me finish. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. And this is Paul again speaking about Christ. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. Church, I am jealous over this church. It's a bad thing when you see a jealous woman. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a God-given thing and a woman to be jealous but if it's not right, it's really dangerous. It does a lot of harm. Jealousy that isn't under Christ. I can't tell you how bad it is. But it is a God-given thing. I'm jealous for you. I have a, and he defines it, it's a godly jealousy. In other words, it is one that's right before God. I'm jealous, I'm care, I'm watching over you, over your souls. For I have espoused you to one husband, one husband, Jesus Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through a subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus that we have not preached, are another spirit, minister in another spirit, are you receiving in another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might bear with it. And so Paul's saying, I'm jealous over you, and I'm really scared for you. I fear for you. Oh, you shouldn't be scared. Yes, I should, because I'm jealous, and I'm wanting to present you as a church to Jesus Christ. Christ acceptable. He's the only cornerstone. He's the only foundation. He's the only bridegroom. And some of you ladies may be looking for your bri bri bridegroom. I'm telling you, this is the bridegroom. All the others are per replicas. You may love your husband or, or your boyfriend or something. You, you may be infatuated with them. They're, at best, they're per reproductions. Thank God if they're good examples, but he is the bridegroom. If you ever find a bridegroom down here and he's a good man, he's still nothing compared to this one. All he is is a shadow, a picture, an example. And if he is good, how much better this bridegroom that comes from on high in all his glory. Saints of God, this is a dangerous hour. I want us here in this church, in this ministry, in this work, I want us to have an apostolic foundation. And that foundation, it is ancient. It is biblical. It is Christ-centered. And you know what? We'll go further with this next week. Let's stand together. Let's praise Him. 
Oh, saints of God, let's worship our chief cornerstone. Let's magnify him. Are you saved? Are you washed in the blood? Are your sins forgiven? I tell you, we have a chief cornerstone. He'll keep everything right in this church. We must have Christ as our cornerstone. We must have him uniting us all together. I do not unite this church. I don't have the power to unite it. Neither do you, but Jesus Christ does. Get in a right relationship with him. Stand in right line and order with him. And I assure you there's going to be a wonderful blessing in the house of God and the church of God. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We magnify you. We exalt you, O God. Lord God, we praise you. We love you. Let the mind of Christ be in this church. Let the same mind, let the same heart, let the same spirit be in us. And Lord God, bring us back to being an ancient, a church with an ancient foundation, a biblical foundation, a Christ-centered foundation that everything is going to be built on him. Lord God, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the righteousness of Jesus. Thank you for all of your blessings through him in Jesus' mighty name. Bless us and keep us and stir us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.